thank you all for joining our colloquium today, um, where we have uh, Richard Lawrence um, here from Tübingen at the Department of Linguistics at the moment, who will speak about Hankel's formalism, Frege's logicism, and the analytic synthetic distinction. Richard, please. Okay, thanks very much. Um, maybe I will start by sharing my screen. Oh, just in this second, a, a note for everybody, when we, we tape this um, uh, talk and maybe put it afterwards on YouTube. So, I mean, if you, if, if you do a question, don't want to be taped, just let us know and then we will cut it later. Thanks. Okay. And everyone can see this. And also when I flip. Good. Uh, so yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I want to talk about some, some recent work I've done on Frege and his logistics program and um, his way of understanding numbers as logical objects. Uh, I found that a good way to get into these issues is to uh, look at Frege's um, characterization of the analytic synthetic distinction. Uh, this is from the Foundations of Arithmetic, section three, where Frege starts by saying, now these distinctions between a priori and a posteriori, synthetic and analytic, concern, I, as I see it, not the content of the judgment, but the justification for making the judgment. The problem becomes, in fact, that of finding the proof of the proposition and of following it up right back to the primitive truths. If in carrying out this process, we come only on general logical laws and definitions, then the truth is an analytic one. If, however, it's impossible to give the proof without making use of truths, which are not of a general logical nature, but belong to the sphere of some special science, then the proposition is a synthetic. So what Frege is characterizing the analytic synthetic distinction here in terms of how a truth is proven from axioms and what those axioms are like. Now, uh, what's kind of puzzling about this is that, you know, this distinction comes from Kant, but this way of characterizing the distinction doesn't sound at all like Kant. Um, Kant, when, when Kant talks about uh, analytic judgments, he'll talk about, you know, containment of concepts, the concept of the predicate is contained in the concept of the subject, uh, or he'll say they're judged purely in accordance with the principle of contradiction. When he talks about synthetic judgments, you know, he'll say they're founded on intuition or something like that. Um, but just none of those things show up here in, in Frege's characterization. So where does he get this idea? You know, what, um, why is he thinking that this is sort of continuous with the Kantian view? Um, and I think that's an important question because at this point in his, his career, Frege is thinking of the logicist, his logicist program uh, as having the goal of showing that arithmetic is, is analytic in contrast to Kant's view. Yeah, so as I say, the, the question is where this idea comes from and the answer that I wanna explore here uh, is that it comes from, at least in part from this guy, Hermann Hankel. Uh, Hankel was a mathematician like Frege. He was writing about a generation before Frege. Uh, he was also a professor in Tübingen, Way. And his Vorlesungen über die komplexen Zahlen und ihre Funktionen, uh, this appeared in 1867. Uh, it was pretty widely read. And Frege actually cites this book in, in the foundations more than any other author. Um, and so I think this book had more of an influence on Frege than, than Frege himself admits. And so what I wanna do in the talk today is to talk about Hankel and the, the role that his view plays in the foundations. Um, so I wanna first introduce his view briefly because it's not very widely known. Um, Hankel is an, an early proponent of the view we would now call mathematical formalism. This is the view that somehow numbers are signs. Uh, then I wanna look at uh, Hankel's argument against Kant which seems to have had a pretty significant influence on Frege's own argument that arithmetic is analytic. And then I'll, I'll close with a discussion of Frege's criticisms of Hankel, which, which uh, come at the end of the foundations. Um, all right, so to get into this a little bit, um, here's a kind of just so story you could tell about the 19th century. Um, 
Kant had argued in the Critique of Pure Reason that arithmetic is synthetic a priori and, and founded on pure intuition. Um, but shortly after that, there's developments in mathematics that kind of put pressure on this view. So you get the rise of non-Euclidean geometry, uh, you get a worked out theory of complex numbers. And so formalized, formalism arises in the 19th century kind of in response to these developments. So it no longer seems plausible that, that mathematics is based on intuition, especially not uh, an intuition of Euclidean space. And so the natural alternative is to say that, uh, well, mathematics is not synthetic in concepts. It's, it's analytic and somehow based on concepts as opposed to intuition. Uh, that story is not really complete and maybe not true, uh, but it, it fits Hunkel pretty well and it's gonna be okay for my purposes today. Um, Hunkel is someone who wants to give a general foundation for arithmetic uh, that can accommodate systems of arithmetic up to uh, and including the complex numbers and, and quaternions. Um, and he wants to get rid of the independence of intuition on the foundations of arithmetic. Uh, in the foundation of arithmetic. Now, to do that, he draws a distinction between uh, what I have translated as presented and uh, formal numbers. Presented is a, my translation for this interesting word, actuel. Um, by the way, all of the translations from Hunkel in the talk are my own, because um, Hunkel's work has not been translated into English as far as I know. And, if anyone has comments about how I could improve them, I would be very happy to have them. Um, yeah, so Hunkel has this distinction between presented and formal numbers. Presented numbers uh, find their representation in the theory of actual magnitudes and their, and their combination. Uh, basically, they're given an intuition. Uh, formal numbers, by contrast, are conceptual or purely intellectual. Uh, and Hunkel says they are not capable of any construction in intuition. So this distinction he's got is kind of paralleling Kant's distinction between intuitions and concepts. Uh, a good way to understand this is to think about like a geometric representation of the complex numbers. So, the, you know, you can think of complex numbers uh, as vectors in the plane, and then there's a, an intuitive representation of what the different arithmetic operations on those numbers uh, do, but then, you know, if, if you abstract from that intuitive geometric picture, then you're kind of just left with the, the complex numbers themselves and the, the rules we have for operating with them. And that's, that's how Hunkel is thinking about formal numbers. Um, so his strategy is to use formal numbers as the foundation for different systems of arithmetic. And that's going to show that arithmetic is based on concepts and analytic. So how does Hunkel think about these formal numbers? Uh, he thinks of them as, he says, they're pure signs which receive their formal meaning through rules governing calculations, uh, through the rules we use to govern calculations. That's um, why he counts as a formalist in our um, contemporary sense. I think the easiest way to understand this, though, though Hunkel doesn't use this analogy himself, is something like the chess piece analogy. So think about pieces uh, in a game of chess. They don't stand for or represent something else, right? Um, instead, the different pieces just play different roles uh, in, in the game of chess, and those roles are determined by the rules of the game. In the same way, the numbers, for Hunkel are just sort of the signs themselves in, in what you might call the game of arithmetic. Um, they don't stand for anything else. Those signs don't stand for anything else, but they play a role um, and that role is determined by the, the rules of calculation. The rules he has in mind uh, are the laws governing the arithmetic operations. So for example, the associative and commutative laws for addition and multiplication. And his thought is that those rules confer a kind of non-intuitive conceptual content on the signs of arithmetic. Um, 
Hankel's idea is that we can basically lay down definitions of the arithmetic operations and use that to use those definitions to build up a system of signs uh, as, as which will be a system of numbers for Hankel um, as kind of the closure of those operations uh, on a uh, initial set of units. So just to take the natural numbers, for example, so we start with the sign one and uh, uh, the definition of the operation of addition. And from there we can get one plus one, which we can then abbreviate as, as with the sign two, uh, and then we'll get two plus one and two plus two and so on. We can build up the whole system from that. Um, there's a lot more we could say to, to make this view somewhat more plausible looking, um, uh, but I think that's gonna be enough for my purposes today. Uh, now what I wanna do is look at Hunkel's argument against Kant. So remember, uh, Kant had said that the truths of arithmetic, the particular truths of arithmetic, like seven plus five equals 12, um, we, we can't know them on the basis of analysis of our concepts, right? Twist and turn, uh, the, the concepts uh, of seven and five and addition, as you will, you're never gonna get 12 out of it. That's, that was Kant's position. Um, but Hunkel thinks that's, that's problematic. Um, he takes Kant to mean, uh, because of the, the, con uh, the connection in Kant between analysis and um, deduction, Hunkel takes Kant to mean that there's no deductive proof of particular arithmetic truths like seven plus five is 12. Um, and that's problematic because the, the structure of mathematics is really, you know, things are certain because we have uh, a proof of infinitely many facts from a finite surveyable set of axioms, right? Uncle says, the apodictic certainty of the statements of mathematics is based on the fact that it deductively erects an infinite structure on an extremely small number of independent base truths. Um, and so on Kant's view in which each arithmetic truth is a sort of a primitive truth you know, that we, we need to, we can't prove deductively, but rather need to appeal to a wish, intuition or um, uh, that, that's going to threaten the certainty of mathematics. Um, Frege, by the way, in his discussion of Kant, uh, basically cites this, this criticism of Hankel's um, this is uh, foundation section five. And he, so he basically just directly quotes Hunkel and then even expresses approval, which is not something that Frege uh, does very often. So he's, he's taken that from Hunkel. Um, Hunkel thinks then, then that, that arithmetic truths need to be provable. Uh, and he argues that they are provable. And he argues like this. Uh, he points to examples like this. Uh, so how do we prove that, that five plus two equals seven? Well, the first step is to appeal to our definition of two. Remember two is just an abbreviation for the sign one plus one. Then we can appeal to the law of uh, the associativity of addition to move the parentheses around. And then twice more, we appeal to these other definitions of particular signs to sort of condense uh, the ones and we get seven out. Now, the important to observe here, right, is that, that such proofs appeal only to the definitions of the individual numbers um, and the general laws of the arithmetic operations. And Hunkel says that proofs like this proceed without any intuition purely mechanically because, because he's conceiving uh, of the proof as manipulating the signs themselves. Um, Frege, again, gives essentially the same argument uh, in, in foundation section six. He cites Hunkel there, also Grassmann and Leibniz. He gives an exactly parallel proof. Um, and he also takes it to show that particular arithmetic truths are provable from general laws and definitions in contrast uh, to Kant. And that this, this eliminates the need to invoke intuition. 
Now, what this argument shows for Hankel is that the question about whether arithmetic is analytic or synthetic reduces to a question about its axioms. He says, there is nowhere any doubt about the possibility of analytically or deductively deriving the further mathematical theorems from these, the axioms. Um, so Hankel has already made the shift here that, that I noted at the beginning of the talk in connection with Frege. Um, he's, he's made the shift away from Kant's formulations of the analytic synthetic distinction. And instead he's shifted toward a characterization uh, of analyticity uh, that's based on the status of the axioms from which a truth is proven. So I think when Frege gives his characterization of the distinction in foundation section three, he's thinking of the distinction in, in Hunkel's way uh, and not in Kant's. Now that leaves open the question of, well, what's the status of these axioms that we have in arithmetic? Uh, and so Hunkel then argues that the axioms we need in arithmetic are indeed analytic and not synthetic. Again, the axioms he has in mind are these general laws governing the arithmetic operations. And he argues that they're analytic based on their generality, uh, contrasting them with, for example, specifically uh, geometric truths. So the, the way he gives this argument, it's kind of interesting actually, he, uh, he makes a list of some axioms um, from Euclid and he says they just sort of naturally fall into two groups. Um, the first are, the first group is, is a set of axioms which are just connected with the general concept of magnitude. There are things like um, to add equals to equals gives equals. And the second group of axioms are sort of specifically geometric truths. And these are things like um, uh, two right angles uh, make a straight line. Um, and Hunkel thinks that, well, you know, if the axioms of, of arithmetic are like the geometric axioms of the second group, then arithmetic would be synthetic. But he argues, no, actually, they are like the axioms of the first group. Uh, and the quote here is his argument for that. Um, they have indeed the character of common notions. They become completely evident through an explication. They are valid for all domains of magnitudes and can, without forfeiting their character, be transformed into definitions, in which one says, by the addition of magnitudes, is understood an operation which satisfies these three principles. Uh, so, yeah, he. At, at least one very important part of this argument is that they are valid for all domains of magnitudes. So the, the generality of these axioms in contrast to the more specific truths um, of geometry is a marker of analyticity for Hankel. Again, Frege um, distinguishes the axioms this way and these, this uh, way of arguing for the analyticity of arithmetic shows up in his own discussion uh, in foundations section 12 through 14 or so. Um, I remember in already in section three, uh, he had distinguished uh, in, in giving the analytic synthetic distinction, uh, he had distinguished the axioms that characterize analytic truths as those which are general logical laws and definitions uh, from those yeah, which, which lead to synthetic truths as those being belonging to the sphere of some special science. Um, and when he gets around to, to comparing the axioms of arithmetic and uh, geometry in section 14, um, he's basically the point is again, exactly that, that arithmetic axioms are much more general than geometric axioms. So he says, the truths of geometry govern all the spatially intuitable, but the basis, basis of arithmetic lies deeper, it seems, than that of any of the empirical sciences and even that of geometry. The truths of arithmetic govern all that is numerable. This is the widest domain of all, for to it belongs not only the actual, not only the intuitable, but everything thinkable. So overall, uh, Hunkel's argument appeals to two ideas, right? Um, first, that the question of analyticity is a question about the nature of the axioms from which a truth is proven. Uh, and second, that the axioms we actually need in arithmetic are the general laws governing the operations, uh, and that those should be regarded as analytic because of their generality. Both of those ideas, uh, as we've seen, show up in Frege's discussion. 
And what this tells us, I think, um, is that Hunkel's formalism has the same goal as Frege's logicism, at least at this, this period in Frege's career, namely showing arithmetic to be analytic. Um, he also has the same basic strategy for meeting that goal. He wants to deductively prove the arithmetic truths from axioms and, the, um, and those axioms themselves have to be regarded as analytic. Um, there are of course some important differences uh, Hankel has, this is, he's writing in 1867, he has no Begriffsschrift, right? He has no conception of formal logic. Um, he also does not see the axioms of arithmetic as logical, though he does think that they're more general than those of geometry. Uh, and he differs from Frege about issues of mathematical existence. Um, and those are the basis, you know, that issue is the basis for Frege's criticisms of Hankel, and that's what I'd like to talk a bit more about now. Um, and the reason for that is it's tied up with Frege's distinction between concepts and objects and his claim that um, numbers are objects. So uh, here are a couple of things Frege says when in his um, criticism of Hankel. He has, a, he has a pretty long discussion of formalism and of Hankel's view at the end of the foundations. He raises a bunch of objections in that uh, discussion. Some of them are more relevant than others, but right in the middle of it, he has a, has a di diagnosis of formalism's central mistake. And he says, this mistake is that uh, formalism uh, fails to distinguish clearly between objects and concepts. He had actually announced this way back in the introduction to the book. Um, where he, as one of his three fundamental principles, he says um, that we ought never to lose sight of the distinction between concept and objects. And in, in motivating that as a fundamental principle, he says, from this it follows that a widely held formal theory is untenable. I think you know, this is kind of puzzling, right? Um, you might expect that the formalist's mistake is that he fails to distinguish between sign, a sign and its content, right? Indeed, Frege says something, it basically says that uh, a couple of sections beforehand in, in section 95, um, but it's pretty hard to see, you know, how the problem could be that the formalist fails to distinguish between two types of content, right? It's one thing to say, well, um, yeah, Formalist, you, you should recognize that there's a difference between the sign and the thing it signifies, right? The, the sign and the number itself. Um, but why is the problem supposed to be that, that the formalist does indeed recognize a notion of content, but doesn't recognize this important distinction uh, in types of content? Now, to make sense of this, I think we need to return to Hunkel's idea that formal numbers are a kind of conceptual content. His thought is that, well, the laws governing formal numbers are definitions um, that we postulate. And his view is that these definitions give us the concepts of the formal numbers. Uh, and we're basically, we're free to lay down whatever definition we like. Um, the only constraint is that those definitions uh, have to be consistent. So he says, how we define the rules of purely formal operations um, is our arbitrary, arbitrary choice, except that one essential condition must be adhered to, namely that no logical contradiction may be implied in these rules. Um, and accordingly, Hunkel thinks, you know, there's no question of, of existence for formal numbers. Uh, the only question we can ask that really makes any sense is the question of whether their definition is consistent. So a few pages earlier, he had written, uh, if, however, the numbers under consideration are logically possible, if they are, their concept is clear and determinately defined for us, and thus without contradiction, that question of, of their existence can only come to this, whether there is in the domain of the real or the, of the actual and intuition of the presented a substrate for them, whether there are objects in which the numbers, that is, intellectual relationship of a certain sort, makes their appearance. So Hankel, Hankel is still um, has a kind of Kantian conception of existence. He thinks of existence, you know, proving the existence of something uh, means exhibiting it in intuition. 
And what this means for him is that existence questions kind of only arise for presented numbers. They, they can't arise for formal numbers. Uh, and this is the point that, that Frege attacks. Um, Frege's argument, when, when he comes around to discussing uh, the problem with Hunkel's view is that, um, well, he, he makes this argument by pointing to examples from mathematical practice uh, where we use a concept to pick out something in, in the course of a proof. So he considers a proof from Euclid uh, in which Euclid constructs, constructs a subsegment AD on a line AC um, where, where the point D is the midpoint, right? It's the between, uh, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. A subsegment AD on a line AC equal to another segment AB. Um, Frege remarks, this proof would collapse if there was no such point as D. And it's not enough that we discover no contradiction in the concept point on AC whose distance from A is equal to B's. So, this is just one example, but there are, you know, it's a totally humdrum example, right? It's, it's um, an example where a concept appears in a, in a complex singular term, you know, a definite description, something of the form BF. Um, and his point is that to use concepts like this as part of a complex sing singular term, it's not enough if the concept is consistent. Instead, when we use that concept to pick out an object, uh, we first need to prove that there is exactly one thing that falls under it. So Frege had said this actually uh, in section 74 in a footnote. If, however, we wish to use this concept for defining an object falling under it, it would of course be necessary first to show two things. First, that some object falls under this concept and second, that only one object falls under it. Um, so this is, this is just an observation about how, um, you know, what the expectations are for proving things in mathematical practice. When you uh, want to refer to a certain object by, um, or use a certain concept to pick out that object so that you can refer to it, uh, you, you first need to give an existence proof and a uniqueness proof. Now, how does this help us make sense of the distinction? Um, and this idea that the formalist mistake is, is that he fails to distinguish between objects and concepts. Well, uh, when summing up his criticisms, I'll now give you a bit more context than I did uh, on a couple of slides back. Frege says, this is the error that affects the, the formal theory of fractions and negative numbers. It's made a postulate that the familiar rules of calculation shall still hold. Is no, if no contradiction is anywhere encountered, the introduction of the new numbers is held to be justified as though it were impossible for a contradiction to be lurking somewhere nevertheless, and as though freedom from contradiction amounted straight away to existence. That this mistake is so easily made, of course, uh, is due, of course, to the failure to distinguish clearly between objects and concepts. Nothing prevents us from using the concept square root of negative one, but we're not entitled to put the definite article in front of it without more ado and take the expression uh, the square root of negative one as having a sense. So my suggestion is that the concept object distinction, at least as it appears here in the foundations, uh, should be aligned with a distinction between postulation and proof. Freya agrees with Hankel that concepts are a kind of content that we can make available just by definition or postulation. Right? As soon as you give a definition, uh, you have this content at your disposal and you can, you can use it in proofs. In particular, um, Frege says, you can use it uh, in proofs of uh, the, the consistency of the concept or the inconsistency. Um, but what Frege is pointing us to here in this argument is that, that complex singular terms like two plus two or the square root of negative one, they don't play the role of concepts in mathematics. They play a different role um, and it's a role that such that we can only legitimately use those terms uh, after giving existence proofs. So the thought is objects, which are the contents of these singular terms, um, are a different kind of content. And that kind of content is one that's made available to us via proof rather than postulation. 
That's, so that's, that's my proposal. Um, what I think is nice about that reading is that uh, we don't need a metaphysical story about what concepts and objects are, which, which Frege doesn't give, right? Uh, instead, the distinction is internal to mathematics and uh, these two categories of concept and objects um, are connected with and to be distinguished by um, different aspects of mathematical practice. So that's what I have to say today. Thanks very much for listening. Um, maybe I'll just close by saying a couple of things about where uh, I'm headed with this. So I'm, I'm generally interested in Frege's theory of content. Um, I would, and I think that Frege's, um, Frege's engagement with formalism is a good place to look for his uh, um, thoughts about content because he has this idea that, that the formalists uh, don't have the right theory of content. So I'm, I'm looking to do further work on um, Frege's arguments against formalism and what they reveal about his own view. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so, I mean, it was agreed that um, we have maybe uh, a shorter exposition of the topic um, here in the talk, but more time for discussion. So mm -hmm. I encourage you uh, to engage in the discussion on this topic in particular, because, I mean, we are here in Tübingen and are supposed to know Hanke very well. So just please speak up. I mean, I think you can just open your microphone. Can you have a question or comment? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about your final point. Mm. So uh, you, you said that you would like to associate concepts with definitions and objects with uh, proofs or postulates. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, no, so concepts are a kind of content that we can uh, make available by postulation or by definition, right? So I, I was kind of thinking of those as the same thing uh, okay. as, as Uncle does. And objects via existence Ob proofs. And yeah, via, via existence proofs. But, well, aren't there two problems here? The first one is with regards to concepts, you need primitive concepts, right? It, the, the bug has to stop somewhere. And similarly for objects and existence proofs. I mean, if you want to prove the existence of something, your proof has to have some existential assumptions on the top, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Uh, where do you get those from in this framework? Uh, well, that's kind of Frege's whole problem, I think. Um, yeah, I totally agree. That's um, Frege gets sort of pushed by this uh, insistence that we need to prove uh, the existence of particular objects into introducing basic law five, um, uh, because that's that's the axiom which allows him to prove the existence of, well, you know, anything. Uh, and so my sense is that it's actually some, some of the considerations that he brings up in these arguments against uh, Hunkel that, yeah, sort of put him in a corner there. Um, and that, that may have been part of his motivation for uh, insisting, well, you know, we need these logical objects and that but the, um, the goal of building a whole system, there's a remark, I think, at the end of uh, the basic laws about how, you know, the, the most important thing is for us to find these logical objects, uh, but where are we going to get them? I, you know, well, basic law five was the answer he had and it, it didn't work out. My name is Ulrich Felkner. Uh, I think there's a basic problem in discussing older texts from the from the 19th century, because at Hunkel's time, logic wasn't developed in the way we are used to know it nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. And he, his opinion was mainly based on Aristotle, for instance, and Leibniz. And 
and Frege also at the beginning, I mean, he was uh, mainly inhaltlich orientated, contentual, right? And that means existence of a mathematical object means that the object has to have per se the property which uh, he should have, yes? In distinction from uh, um, just by behavior, you know, the Aristotelian the distinction between Kathauto uh, and Symbebikos. This was the whole history in Germany and I think in the European continent up to 1900, the very basic distinction. If you prove a mathematical object to exist, say a number, number 10 or number 12 in, in Kant's uh, example, you have to give an, ex, uh, an object which has the property of being 12 Kathauto, that means per se, but yeah, and not simply because it means uh, it has to be an attribute and not an accident, mm -hmm. right? And okay. this is the main difficulty in understanding Hankel, for instance, and also Frege. When Frege criticizes Hankel, he says you only prove by consistency that there exists as a model. And then in the model, the numbers exist, but having the properties only as um, accidentian, yes, and not uh, per se. And that's the difference. And you miss, uh, you overlook that problem in your criticism. And this is Frege's discussion of Hankel in the Grüngesetze or? A Yes, it's the end of the foundations of arithmetic. They criticize Hankel uh, for proving, then say, the existence of two minus three. Yes, that it that is, exists as a number. Yes, but it's only say in the model by the consistency you have a model in which such an object exists with a property but the property is not cut how to means not per se the object but it's just an arbitrary set or an arbitrary object in the model and which does not have the property as a permanent uh, basic uh, essential property you mm. see and that's the difference well that's very interesting um I cannot think of any place in, in the text where Frege said something to that effect, but I haven't read everything Frege wrote either. And I know there is discussion of Hankel. Oh, I mean, there are lots of points in Frege's discussions. For instance, in the Begriffsschrift, yes, mm -hmm. when he introduces equality uh, or identity, he first introduces the equality by means of content. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the notion of content he is using is comes from Antoine Arnaud and Pierre Nicole, yes. And then uh, inhalt or content is defined uh, by the collection of all attributes a thing has and which you can't uh, forget without uh, destroying the concept. Yes, but that is always referring to essential properties. Okay. It means the properties which the object has cut how to. So, yes. so your thought is that this is, this is in the background, but it's not something, it's not explicit. No, you are discussing it too much from the point of view of 20th century logic, yeah. okay. not from the point of view of that time. Yeah. That's the Okay, thank you. That's I. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have much to say about that. Um, but that's good. That's a good uh, thing to note. Uh, may I ask, uh, Professor Feldner, do you treat of this in your book on the philosophy? Yes, of course, of course. Okay, thank you. It's extremely interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. May I pick it up or? Um... Uh, it's more a question to, to uh, Felkner than to, to you, Richard. Um, I mean, as I see it at this moment, and how to say it, I mean, as a um, stanch Hilbertanian, um, I think both, or should I <laughs> include Aristotle, all three, so would plainly reject implicit definitions. 
because they could not be uh, cut out of. Should I ask? <laughs> should I? Uh, yeah. I mean, the definition of uh, say that no, I, sh I should start differently. Uh, notions, the history of the notion of notion is a very long and difficult history, yes. And it starts with uh, Plato, Plato already, but uh, was got a certain uh, amount, you know, final state uh, in the Middle Ages. And at that time, uh, it wasn't clear what a definition really is. I mean, for instance, uh, to have implicit definitions that was not known at that time, that comes with uh, this jargon in a way, but not inside logic. That inside logic, it starts only with Hilbert. So it's also not fair to introduce this in a discussion between Hunke and Frege. They didn't know at that time what in, uh, implicit definitions are. Maybe turn it like that. Maybe they use implicit definition without knowing it, so well, without realizing it, mm -hmm. so to speak. And but I mean, you are uh, totally right. If we criticize them, uh, I mean, for the text there, we have to do it on, I mean, on their understanding and, and not on ours. But thanks, yeah. Uh, May I just ask a question uh, concerning uh, the notion of uh, definition in uh, in Hankel? So, so just in defense of Hankel, I mean, Frege's criticism is is, uh, is criticizing that uh, a definition must be of something must be unique, and the object uh, being defined uh, must uh, exist, and, and uh, neither of these uh, conditions is met with Hankel, right? So, so this is essentially. What Frege says, uh, <clears throat> this notion of uniqueness, of course, the, the, this is important, and uh, this is something in which uh, Hunkel's approach fails. But I mean, this existence thing, I mean, this is not necessary. I mean, does it have to be the case? I mean, you you could understand the whole thing conditionally or partially to say, well, uh, uh, if uh, there are natural numbers in this sense, in this unique sense, uh, then they have the following properties and uh, then you can start uh, deriving things. So I think this is, uh, so if I, if I wanted to to, to defend uh, Hunkel against Frege, I would say, well, you are right as far as uniqueness is concerned. So at least, I mean, I, uh, uh, a natural number should be characterized uh, uniquely, but uh, do we have to prove that they exist? Perhaps not. We just uh, define what their uh, their uh, uh, properties are, and this is it, right? Yeah. That, so that's certainly one way of defending it. I think that would be um, it's a little bit in tension with with the thing Hunkel actually says, um, where he. He seems to indicate, look, this, this question of existence um, just can't be a question we can ask about the formal numbers. Uh, and, and so the way I think of uh, Hunkel's position and Frege's response to it is, Hunkel says, look, the, the question of existence applies only to presented numbers. Um, it's, it's when you answer that question uh, by giving a presented number um, and there, there can really not be any question of existence for formal numbers. Right, exactly. So, so, so you, you could say, I mean, as far as the formal numbers are concerned, I mean, we prove, we, 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 uh, 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 we show that they have certain properties, but I mean, existence is uh, not an issue here. So, so that, that, yeah. that you could say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I, I just wanted to think, you know, I think um, Hunger might be a bit hesitant to, to uh, reformulate what his position in, in this sort of um, uh, conditionalized way, right? Like if the numbers exist, then they're, no, no the formal numbers, yeah, we need a different word. You can't say they, they exist, but you know, the concept's there, right? Um, there's, no, there's no hypothesis um, that we need. 
but it's just this, this issue of existence is a different one. May I ask a question? Thank you. Please. Well, thank you for the talk. I learned a lot. It was really interesting for me. Um, I was wondering whether Hankel says a bit more about the relation between analyticity and generality, because it seemed to be important for him that, well, you, something is analytic if in the end it is somehow based on totally general axioms. And um, where does this come from? I mean, the Kantian containment idea of analyticity has nothing to do with generality, it seems. Um, so where does this close relation come from? And also, uh, just out of interest, does Hankel say a bit more about the notion of generality itself? I mean, does he try to analyze it and say, what makes a truth a general one? Um, um, uh, sorry, I need to flip back out of my screen view. Um, yeah, so the, I can't think of any place where he, he goes into more detail about this. Um, there is, you know, the discussion of um, his, his argument against Kant and his, his argument that arithmetic is analytic is pretty brief. Um, he does have these three criteria in that he cites uh, and they're somehow connected, but the, the language is pretty, you know, a, a bit difficult to understand, you know, how they're connected. So what he says is um, the axioms of arithmetic, they belong to this first group of axioms that the, the more general ones, because um, first of all, they become completely evident through an explication. So that, uh, I think he's at least using that terminology to sort of invoke the Kantian idea that analytic judgments are explicative uh, judgments. Um, they are valid for all domains of magnitudes. Um, then that, you know, that's the main source for this generality idea. Uh, and can, without forfeiting their character, be transformed into definitions. Um, and again, uh, I, I take that to be a bit you know, to be connected to the idea that um, an analytic judgment for con uh, you know, gives sort of like a part of the definition of a concept, right? It makes makes part of the definition of a concept explicit. So when you say, you know, um, a triangle has three interior angles, um, then yeah, three interior angles is explicating the concept of triangle. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid I can't point you to anything else uh, than other than that passage. May I? Uh, <laughs> Please, yes. <laughs> things there. Uh, as far as I understand Kant, what he really meant was that uh, what Aristotle called dehoti, proved uh, by this method of dehoti, that means you just have the essential properties of the objects, yeah? And you are proving by logical means only from the uh, list of essential properties the objects under discussions have. You are not allowed to use any additional uh, assumption or uh, postulates or axioms, yeah? And that's the point. And uh, in the discussion by uh, Frege, whether and also Hunkel, whether uh, these proofs uh, 5 plus 7 equals 12 is analytic or not, um, what they are missing is that uh, they use uh, some axioms uh, like uh, associativity, commutativity, etc., which are not uh, elements of the set of essential definition, uh, essential properties, you see. And uh, I mean, the, con the uh, Kant argument uh, is correct in so far as he uses only the knowledge of his time. And in all mathematical textbooks of his time, uh, 
addition is not a mathematical op operation. It's just the uh, usual uh, of the normal language. Everyone understands what is meant by addition by taking together. So it's not treated as a mathematical constant, a mathematical object. So it doesn't have a mathematical definition. And if you read Kant's argument, you are using, he is using only properties of the, of the number constants, seven, five, and 12, but he does not use uh, any properties of the uh, definition of uh, addition. So addition, uh, I mean, for us, uh, clearly, one has to use the definition of us, of a plus also in the argument, but not at Kant's time, because mathematicians never used uh, defined addition as a mathematical operation. Yeah. Hmm. So it's the point. You, uh, I mean, at his time, uh, what in discussing uh, synthetic and analytic proofs means you only use the definitions of the essential properties of the objects uh, which are used there. And if plus, for instance, is not understood as a mathematical operation, but just has the normal uh, understanding of everyday language, yes, then uh, the properties of plus are not uh, involved in the argument. Was I clear? I mean, I, I yeah, could, that's very clear. I uh, German, but, but uh, English. <laughs> um, the um, yeah, what? So what I what I don't quite yet understand is um, that may very well have been true for Kant, but. Why would it still have been in the associative law, for example? Why would that still have been regarded as a non-essential property? By now, if you criticize Kant and what Kankel did and what Frege did, yes, this is not fair because Kant simply used the mathematics of his day. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it, for the mathematics of those days, his argument is complete and correct. Yes. Mm -hmm but it's incomplete and not correct uh, for later developments. For instance, uh, addition was introduced by recursive def uh, in a recursive way by Grassmann, 1860, yes? And using these properties there and the definition of plus, then uh, it turns out to be analytic, that's right. But so it's, uh, it's not a philosophical question, it's only the question, what was considered in those days? I mean, is it is it analytic just because there are uh, because there is a recursive definition? I mean, Kant would have said, well, even in order to justify these definitions, we need to be some intuition of time or so. So we must go go somewhere to the to uh, to the outer world. And even modern constructivists, I mean, they would say, man, in, in, if if we want to justify the axiom of arithmetic, we have this intuition that there is one and uh, another one and another one or so. And this essentially it has to do with time or so. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't a formal definition in in his days, so you had to use it in in space and in time. Mm. and therefore it's synthetic in his view, mm. yes. Yeah, but, but I would say, I mean, if, if, if you look at what a modern constructivist, Brauer and Kronick and, 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 and all these people are so, I think they had, uh, they, would, they would say something of a similar kind or so, that uh, something like uh, this idea of time or of progressing in time is somehow related to, to the notion of counting. So the idea one and another one and another one and so, don't you think so? No, what I meant is only uh, you have to be fair to Kant. Yes. Yeah, right, right, exactly. That, that, that's what, that's what yeah. correct, but uh, mm. for our time, it's a different situation. Yeah. Yes, we have formal systems, and we can say uh, inside a formal system, this is a result, and it need, needs not time and space. Mm -hmm. Yes, but for Kant's time, uh, how had been uh, numbers introduced? Yes, I mean, the addition of seven plus one, seven and eight plus one, etc., cetera, uh, proceeds in, in the time. And therefore he says, uh, 
if you consider mathematics uh, done like that, you have to acknowledge that time is used. I, 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 I just wanted so to be explaining to the, Kant, yeah. not explaining uh, yeah. Frege and, and Hunkel. Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to defend Kant even on the basis of certain modern definitions. So, so in constructivism, so, so Brauer, for example, he would argue, argued like Kant or so, I guess, or so in, if, if he wanted to justify the, the, the axioms or so. We have a certain intuition or so, and, and, and from that we, we arrive at the axioms. And so they're, they're not just, uh, just laid down. So, mm. Yeah, that does seem to be an important, um, an important difference. So, and, and I guess that maybe goes to the, the issue of whether these are essential properties. You know, Hunkel, Hunkel is pretty explicit that he thinks these laws are, well, actually, um, yeah, we sort of, we lay them down on our own authority. Right? The, only, the only constraint we have in laying down uh, laws of arithmetic um, is wh whether they are consistent. On the other hand, he does sort of have this idea that um, the, way, the way we arrive at the laws that we, that we pick, as it were, is um, you know, we start with an intuitive representation and uh, then what will happen is that uh, that that so for example imagine um, uh, we have the idea that that um, number is uh, yeah um, sort of a representation of, of spatial positionings. Hunkel, this is one idea that Hunkel starts with, um, uh, and. <clears throat> with that representation, that sort of intuitive representation, um, you can uh, you can make sense of what it means to add positive numbers to a representation. But then Hunkel has this idea that well, we should always be able to um, uh, to invert the uh, operations that we've got. So when I have, once I can ask a question like, well, which number um, added to two gives me five? For Hunkel, I also have the question, uh, which number added to five gives me two? And it's at the point that you ask that second question that you see, ah, this intuitive idea I've got that, that um, adding a number is like putting more objects into my spatial representation, um, uh, that that, representation is no, no longer adequate. And so what I have to do is sort of abstract from it and just lay down the laws. Um, uh, and that's, that's how you get the negative numbers, for example. That's why, you know, so what you do is you lay down the laws defining addition and then you say, okay, these laws have to be valid in general. Um, and, and it's by insisting that they be valid in general that we now have a need for uh, negative numbers as inverses, you know, uh, additive inverses of positive numbers. Uh, and at first, you know, there's no intuitive representation of them, but we just, we insist that the laws have to be valid in general. Yeah, please. May I uh, give a, a remark to that, a historical remark. In order to understand Hunkel's way of discussing this problem of negative numbers, uh, one has to know that in England, uh, sometimes ago, before his time, uh, it was doubted whether one should be allowed to treat num negative numbers in mathematics. And there had been a huge uh, discussion done by Greenhouse and Francis Mazer and others, Peacock, for instance, Babbage, you know, and uh, they, in, uh, did the following in order to make uh, negative numbers uh, yes, understood or usable in mathematics. Um, yes, to introduce formalism. And the way, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the way Hunkel uh, introduced the negative numbers 
is just on the basis of these British discussions, uh, how to introduce uh, negative numbers, namely to not to treat them as great, what, what is größer uh, magnitudes, yes? Because uh, it was doubted if uh, magnitude is always positive, so you can't have negative magnitudes. And that was the idea why negative numbers are not uh, allowed in mathematics. So Hunkel's first step was to say, we are not treating magnitudes, but uh, formal objects, yes. And then uh, to discuss a mental uh, domain of objects which can behave as uh, numbers. And uh, you see, and yeah, I think this is uh, better to explain the actual Zahlen uh, what uh, Hunkel means, means uh, those which you can uh, discuss on paper, on, 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 on the line, yes, there's a zero and then the plus, uh, the positive numbers are on the one, one side, the negatives on the other side, these are the actual ones, because you can represent them uh, on paper, but in contrast to the formal ones, which are uh, done, constructed in the mind by a formal system. You see? Yes, I and so it, uh, I think though um, that, that that's that seems compatible with what I said. You know, the the actual numbers are those that are presented in intuition. You know, that we have an intuitive representation of. Or no, it's more that you have a concrete one, like the complex numbers, their points or vectors uh, in space. In, in yes, you see. What Gauss did 1830, when he introduced the big, quadrat big quadratic reciprocity laws, he introduced complex numbers representing them as points in the, in the plane, yes? So these are actual representations, they are actual there, but these are not real numbers, they're not really numbers because they're just points, geometrical objects, yes? So, but these are the actual, what, Hanke calls the actuelle Zahlen, but to make mathematical objects out of them, you have to introduce them by concepts, by a mental construction. You all right? Is so that's, um, what makes them actual is the question I want to ask there. That they are present, uh, say, they have the other images of the uh, mental objects in the real space. And Hunkel says, uh, uses the word, dass sie in der Wahrheit uh, wahrnehmbar sind. Mm. Mm -hmm. um. And you understand that to mean that. Yes, I mean, for sort of externally, as it were. Um, no, you have a, a concrete image. I mean, what Bloquet did in 1484, when he first introduced negative numbers, and Michael Stiefel in his uh, uh, Arithmetic Integra, uh, 1544, I think, this representing them on a line, yes? And these are the actual actual Zahlen, but these are not really numbers, but uh, just images. Or representations for numbers. So, uh, um, as and, and sin, and yeah, sinnliches Bild uh, of them. But what you need is the uh, conceptual objects in the mind. Yeah, and they are done uh, by a formal system. Yeah, exactly, and and. So I guess what I'm not clear on yet is, isn't that, you know, or how is that distinction now different from the, the Kantian one between intuitions and concepts? Um, if, the, if the, so if the actual numbers are those which I can present geometrically on a number line, for example, um, 
And then the formal ones are the ones which I grasp conceptually uh, as opposed to through this intuitive presentation. I mentioned this only to make clear of what Hunkel meant is yes. not to explain Kant or Frege or anyone else. I think the others didn't think like that. Okay. All right, that, that's helpful though. Um, do you know of anyone, by the way, who uses this word other than Hankel? Aktuell? So I haven't. No, no, no. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Okay. Just his term. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can say. Um, it, yes, thank you for all of your comments. 